Outstanding, thank you. Good afternoon, it's uh, February 23rd, 1 p.m. and we're now getting ready to start our House Economic Matters hearings. Um, you're coming before the House Economic Matters Committee today. I would ask that if you're testifying, obviously please wait your turn. Uh, note that the chat is only for members, so I ask you not to enter anything to the chat. And um, same with the hand raising function. Obviously you have uh, two minutes to speak our uh, colleague, our presenters themselves will have the sponsors of the bill, will have unlimited time, but I would ask our sponsors to try to be respectful of your colleagues as far as the amount of time that you take to present your own bill. You don't need to cover every aspect of the bill. Um, we're starting today. We have two bills from Delegate Saab and a bill from Delegate Brooks, two bills from Delegate Brooks, and then uh, one bill from Delegate Hornberger, which will go last. So uh, let's start with House Bill 852, it's Delegate Saab on the line. And why would he be? Okay, well, um, Delegate Saab has the first two bills, so we'll move on to Delegate Brooks. All right, thanks, Mr. Chair. We'll start with your 996, please. Okay, 996, yes. Uh, <clears throat> all right, Chair, Chair Wilson, Vice Chair Cos Cosby, and uh, members of my August <clears throat> committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on behalf of HB 996. As corporations and association ratification of defective corporate acts. Uh, for the record, I'm Delegate Ben Brooks. I represent the 10th Legislative District in Baltimore County. Uh, on occasions, corporations, particularly newly formed corporations, rush to get it <clears throat> underway without seeking sound legal advice and without addressing requirements under the Maryland <clears throat> General Corporation Law, that's the MC, uh, MGCL. For organizing the corporation, issuing uh, stock, and authorizing corporate acts, and on occasion when lawyers are hired, errors are made. Yeah, uh, these <clears throat> defective corporate acts include a uh, failing to adopt uh, bylaws, a uh, failing to elect a president, a treasurer, and a secretary, all of which are required for a corporation to be organized. Issuing stock <clears throat> in excess Thank of you. authorized uh, capital, you know. <clears throat> uh, failing to seek stockholders approval for an act under the MGCL or other ch uh, corporate charters, a, a board of directors approving an act at a meeting where a quorum is not present, you know, and, and taking an act without filing articles of amendment, articles of merger, or other articles that, that are required. Presently, corporations and lawyers upon discovering a defective corporate act may face challenges to fix the problem. Ratifying or curing a defective corporate act may require a settlement agreement, a waiver from impact, <clears throat> impacted parties, a rescission offering, or redoing transactions. You know, the Maryland General <clears throat> Corporation Law in Section 2-208E and 2-208.1E provides a solution for shares to prefers to preferred stock or issued before articles supplementary are filed. But the MGCL does not otherwise provide any statutory path to ratify a defective corporate act. The Maryland State Bar Association's Committee on Corporate Law, looking to the Model Business Corporation Act and the Delaware Corporate Law, has developed legislation that would provide a statutory safe harbor for ratification of a defective corporate act. Uh, the existing common law cures would remain available but HB 996 would provide a clear set of rules for ratification. HB 996 establishes step-by-step -step requirements and provides for a new charter filing, articles of val validation, which would be filed when a prior corporate filing was defective or if the required corporate filing was never filed. With the input of the Maryland State Bar Association's Committee of Corporate Law, as amended, HB 996 will be more in line with the Model Business Corporate Corporation Act and the MSBA original purpose. For these reasons, I'm requesting a favorable report. And Mr. Chair, I do have someone who can, <clears throat> uh, an oral testimony person who can speak more about this, uh, Mr. Scott Wilson, Vice Chair. And there's also a written testimony by the Maryland State Bar Association. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, two uh, oral. We have uh, Scott Wilson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and speak with you. Um, uh, my name is Scott Wilson. As uh, Delia Brooks shared, I'm the Vice Chair of the Committee on Corporation Laws of the Business Law Section of the MSBA. Um, I, I have very little to add uh, beyond what Delegate Brooks shared, um, which I think was a perfect encapsulation of the need for this bill. Um, I would only add that um, this bill has been in the works with the committee and the business law section for a number of years, building upon the fire, fine prior work of uh, both um, the state of Delaware and the Model Business Corporation um, Act and the ABA. Um, the goal here, as Delegate Brooks shared, is really to establish, establish a safe harbor for correcting these defective corporate acts so that uh, parties can be assured that if they comply with the statute, um, the correction or the ratification will be recognized by third parties, stockholders, uh, potential acquirers. Um, with that, uh, I, I would only add that, you know, the committee and the business law section really appreciate Delegate Brooks' sponsorship and support of the business community over the years, and particularly with regard to this important bill. And with that, um, we would certainly uh, ask that the committee issue a favorable report with um, certain sponsor amendments that um, I understand Delegate Brooks has either submitted or um, his uh, office is in the process of submitting and happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I have that. Yeah, the, the amendment has been submitted and we're just waiting on it, but it was incorporated in my testimony. Okay. All right. No questions, we have one more. Uh, William Carlson. Yes, Chair Wilson, hello. Um, I, I will not uh, expand or repeat the testimony. I'm here uh, to join Mr. Wilson. I'm the chair of the Maryland State Bar Committee on Corporation Law in the event there are any questions from any of the, the committee members. Well, seeing no questions, I appreciate your brevity, sir. Uh, we'll be moving on to the next bill, which is House Bill 999, which is also Delegate Brooks. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chair Wilson, Vice Chair Crosby, and members of my, uh, my committee. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the opportunity to testify before you on House Bill 999, uh, Corporations and Associations Provisions. Uh, for the record, I'm Delegate Ben Brooks. I represent the 10th Legislative District in, in Baltimore County. Uh, the purpose of this bill is to alter numerical miscellaneous provisions of the Corporation and Association Articles including those related to one, limited existence corporations, st two, stockholders participation in meeting by remote communications, three, indirect owned stock, shares of stock, four, mergers between parent and subsidiary corporations, and five, dissolution of corporations, as amended by the Baltimore Law Section of the Maryland State Bar Association, HB 999 seeks to clear up various aspects of the business law statute. HB 999 clarifies rules for participation by stockholders in virtual stockholder meetings. Additionally, it permits the articles of dissolution to be filed with a, late, with a later effective date and authorizes a director to file a dissent by electronic transmission, i.e. emails. Further, it offers the modest correction to various sections of this, of this statute to clarify unclear provisions and eliminates outdated language. For that reason, I'm requesting a favorable report and we do have um, oral testimony by Mr. Uh, uh, Bill Carson. He's the chair of Maryland State Bar Association Committee on Corporate Law. And there's written testimony also by the MSBA. Okay, uh, seeing no questions, we're going to Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Elder Brooks. Thank you, Chair Wilson. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, once again, Delegate Brooks has given such an outstanding review of it, I have little to add. Um, I, I'll, I'll think I'll add just two kind of practical matters as we <clears throat> kind of make some technical corrections just to give um, maybe some life and breath to some of these technical things we're trying to change. Um, we've all, well, we're experiencing right now a virtual meeting instead of in person there in the, in the Economic Matters Committee room. And as we're all experiencing that more Zoom calls, Microsoft team calls, you know, the rules about stockholder meetings have been a little confused. And right now, under Maryland law, we have two sets of rules. So we want to harmonize it in this statute. 
Um, you know, for example, if you have a thousand people on the line, they all can't talk at once. Maybe you raise the hand, maybe the host mutes people until they're recognized. So we're kind of facilitating the way these meetings are actually held in practice and properly. Uh, but everybody's still getting their voice. On the articles of dissolution, having a later effective date, right now, when you file articles of dissolution and they're accepted by the SDAT, our friends there, um, it's effective as of that date. And if you want to pick uh, a date such as December 31, which might be a holiday or might be a day where the state's closed, uh, you can't have that date for tax purposes because you can't file that date. So we're trying to have a later effective date function. Um, so those are two of the things we're trying to do with this technical bill. And thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, in summary, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, primarily all we're doing, we're, we're adjusting to the new normal. You know, uh, there, there, were, there were times before when uh, Internal Revenue Service, they would only accept uh, original signatures. Now we can do electronic signatures. So this is just a transgression into, into the new normal. Understood. Mm -hmm. All right, that concludes that hearing. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to uh, Delegate Sid Saab, House Bill 852. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Apologies for not um, being online right where you were calling me. But um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the ECM committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Delegate Sid Saab, and I'm here presenting House Bill 852. I am bringing this bill before you as a pro-business bill, which is absolutely bipartisan. In fact, two similar bills have already been heard in this committee, one by Delegate Chi and one by the speaker on behalf of the administration. This bill will help every entrepreneur in my district and in your district directly. It helps in breaking the barrier for those who want to start a small business right here in Maryland. House Bill 852 simply eliminates the reporting filing fee of $300. This bill is not new to this committee and has been introduced many times in the past. But what is different this time that we have a study that supports the elimination of this fee. I'd like to thank the committee for passing last year the, that required SDAT to for, perform a study and most notably shout out to Delegate Chief for championing last year's bill as well as this year's bill. SDAT conducted a study and came up with two recommendations this past December. They recommended to eliminate the filing fee altogether, make an online fee cheaper. House Bill 852 will eliminate the $300 annual fee for the LLCs. It also eliminates the 100 annual fee for family farms if they file online. According to SDAT, the majority of businesses, sorry, the majority of businesses use an online portal. For small business and entrepreneurs, $300 is a significant amount of money that can, financial, that can create financial hardship. Removing this, would undoubtedly promote a friendlier entrepreneurial climate in Maryland, which is desperately needed. LLC remained the most popular business structure for new businesses. This change would positively affect the Maryland small business community. Due, drafting, due to a drafting error, I have an amendment in your packets or in, in your uh, online portal. And as amended, what this bill simply does is just eliminates the $300 filing fee as long as this, this return is filed online. Maryland needs to be competitive and pro-business now more than ever. This bill promotes new business. For most importantly, it keeps businesses here in Maryland. And with that, I request a favor report on House Bill 852. Okay, thank you. I see a question from Delegate Blair. Yeah, Delegate Saab, you said there was two other bills. Would you say yours is the most superior of those three bills together? Um, you know, I think uh, the, the objective here, the, I think the, the bills are very similar um, and any bill that passes that committee would be extremely helpful. But, um, you know, I'm, um, I think all the bills are good. Thank you for your honesty, Ed, sir. Oh, good. Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, Delegate Saab, I, I'm noticing on your bill all the way at the end, it's not a problem with the bill per se. I love the bill, but it says prior introductions, none. And I saw that on the other bills, Delegate Cheese bill and a couple of the other ones that have been floating around out here about finally eliminating this fee. Prior introductions, none. And uh, I, I, it's, just, it's just that direct. I, that's just not, I, as far as I'm concerned, it's just not true. I mean, I've seen bills like this come through our caucus several times. 
uh, initiatives like this come from the governor several times. Can you look into it to see if there's been legislation like this that's been submitted, whether it's it doesn't matter by who <clears throat> or when or where, but I, I've seen this type of stuff before and it's saying prior introduction, none. And I just, I'd like to get to the bottom of that. So, well, you know, we'll funny, funny you, you, um, you actually asked this question and your timing is great. I actually have um, delegate Mark Fisher here with me and if, Mr. Chairman, if you can let him answer that question, so, because I think he has. Yes, that's been introduced add. before. In fact, several people have re reintroduced it. So hi, everybody. Yeah, I keep seeing none. Like we've never had this. Like this is all of a sudden this new, and you know this has been a topic on business owners' mind and Marylanders' minds for. I, I've been in business seventeen years. Got to be twenty years, and then all of a sudden it's just saying none, none, no introduction. So I'm just a little bit, uh, just wondering if we get to the bottom of it. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not sure there's a conspiracy. I do know that you're correct that multitudes of individuals <laughs> have filed this prior and. Uh, when we get time, maybe we will get to the bottom of it. I'll see what I can do. Right now we're uh, Delegate Chi, lastly. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hello, Delegate Saab. Um, um, I, I just want to uh, clarify from what I heard from you. It sounds like it's very similar to the governor's bill and, and to my bill in many ways. Um, for, so the first part is to waive business filing fee if they file online, right? We're all consistent on that one. The second part is about uh, is about uh, family farms uh, filing fee. So my bill would waive altogether uh, family farms. And according to my data collected from Mesta, there are only like 787 family farms left in, in Maryland. So uh, the, the revenue uh, is only like 70,000 know, a year to the state, uh, which I think uh, is, is a very important important gesture with a very small loss of revenue to the state. Um, so your bill proposes waiving of the filing fee only if they file online. Is that the only difference between our bills? Yes. So if you file online, which the vast majority of people, I think it's not close to 95%. I'm not sure, but about right about there. Um, and, and the reason I mentioned the family farm, because they their typical um, uh, filing fee is $100, but for other, any other businesses, regardless of its size, it's $300. So I mentioned just to this, this clarification that this bill will do away with all annual filing fees as long as they're filed online. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, could you take over the next witness is uh, Stuart Schmidt. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate your time, this opportunity this afternoon. I'm speaking on behalf of small businesses. Uh, my wife and I own three small businesses, LLCs here in the state of Maryland. And when we're looking at that filing fee, uh, I would like to make sure that the committee votes for uh, eliminating that filing fee. Having those three small businesses, it does create a burden on behalf of us. Um, sometimes it's a timing burden. Uh, we also operate some real estate holdings outside of our LLCs, um, making sure that our LLCs stay in good standing. Sometimes having to physically go to Preston Street to handle that filing fee can be quite cumbersome. Uh, so I ask the committee today to uh, please uh, rule in favor of uh, eliminating that $300 filing fee from SDAT. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Julia House. Good afternoon, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Julia Howes, President and CEO of the Southern Anne Arundel Chamber of Commerce. We represent 175 members, most of which are small businesses. We are in favor of House Bill 852, which would eliminate the $300 annual fee for LLCs, eliminate the $100 annual fee for family farms, and eliminate the online filing fee for those who wish to use that service. Removing these fees that have been a financial burden for these companies would make Maryland a more friendlier business state and reduce the financial hardship. Most companies within our chamber are LLCs and could use that money many other ways in their business, our community, and with their employees. Every business owner is looking for ways to keep expenses down, especially right now as the economy continues to recover. Prices are high for their equipment, materials, and daily operations. This is something that will benefit them without hurting our state. Anything we can do to help online filing is a win for everyone. So removing that fee for filing online will help with the administrative burden of filing by paper or in person. Technology security are already there within the state system to accommodate this online urge. 
and would be an incentive for businesses. In addition, accountants prefer them for their clients. Please join us and vote in favor of House Bill 852. Thank you. Thank you, Colby Ferguson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, member, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau, and uh, we come in support of, of House Bill 852, uh, 852. We also support House Bill 409, House Bill 722, whichever one of those three you want to push through, we would love it. Um, where it also removes, uh, as you said, the $100 filing fee for family farms, but uh, a lot of our farms have have added LLCs to the farming operations, especially as, as they have diversified and brought the next generation on. And so um, there's quite a few of the farm operations would actually be in an LLC and uh, that removes that $300 fee. So it's not just the family farm, it's also the LLCs that uh, we wanna make sure uh, uh, don't have to have that filing fee as well. Uh, so we would support uh, House Bill 852 as amended, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Ferguson. Yeah, I was kind of scrambling in the background to go back to see if you were on the other bills as well. Uh, but I appreciate you coming. Delegate Brooks. Uh, that, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Th this uh, question is for Mr. Stewart, uh, Smith, Stuart Smith. Mr. Smith, you, you say you, you experienced a difficulty getting down to 301 Preston Street. Uh, ca can't you file those uh, personal property re returns online and they, you can also pay for them online? Yes, Delegate Brooks, thank you for that question. Um, yes, the online filing does make it um, a lot smoother process. Um, sometimes within our different LLCs, we operate some real estate entities out of that. So we've had to actually get down to Preston Street to handle a good standing certificate. So it's just been a, it's been going on for quite some time and a number of years of having to do that. So yes, we do file online um, yeah. or we mail in a check. Um, but it, just eliminating that would have to, you know, prohibits a step Jesus that we have Christ. to go through just a common sense bill that that we can eliminate that altogether right yeah because i think when, once you file online you have to pay online as well and then i think you can get a, a certificate of good standing online as well matter of fact it's yeah. almost instant i think once you once you file and, and pay so yeah yeah, yeah it's become then, a smoother process that's correct right right and mr chair th this question is for the sponsor and it's a sponsor uh yes, yeah. How does your bill differ from the one that the governor filed? Actually, it doesn't. It's um, it mirrors the um, as amended. It mirrors the uh, the governor's the governor's bill. Okay. It's and now, similar. Yeah. I. I. Uh, your bill would uh, would eliminate the filing fee uh, for online filing as well as um, just regular paper filing. No, just for online filing. Just for online filing. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks. Uh, so which, thank which, you. Actually, which actually, if I can add, I know the, the fiscal note, uh, uh, when it was originally uh, submitted, it was a little bit higher. But now with, with the amendment, um, we, we can't request an, another fiscal note. But since it mirrors the, um, the same or does the same thing as the administration's bill, it's the same. It would have a similar fiscal note. Okay. All right. Uh, th thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And that concludes the hearing for House Bill 852. Next, we'll go to House Bill 853, Delegate Saab. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. And uh, again, good afternoon, members of um, ECM committee. For the record, my name is Delegate Sid Saab, testifying House Bill 853. This bill applies to non-stock and religious corporations, also known as non nonprofits, such as churches and booster clubs, etc. Every business in Maryland including non-stock entities, are required to file an annual report with SDAT in order to remain in good standing. This bill specifically addresses the issue to the non-stock entities. So when an annual report is missed, SDAT places that entity in not in good standing status. And if the issue is not corrected the following year, those entities get forfeited and lose their charter and in turn lose their nonprofit status. When that happens, those entities are no longer able to raise money. So currently, once a non-stock or religious corporation falls out of good standing and gets forfeited, they have to reapply for revival. And in order to do that, first, they have to file the missing reports, which is not an issue, but they also must prove to us that they have filed every single return since its inception. Then they need to get a tax clearance certificate from each county that the nonprofit has property in. 
So for example, and this is a true story, the Booster Club in Anne Arundel County was established in 1979, missed one report in 2016, filed their report for 2017 on time, but then realized in 2018 that they already missed their 2016 report. So by that definition, SDAT considers them that they missed two years of uh, filing and their charter was forfeited. And in order to revive the corporation or the charter, they need to prove to us that they have filed every single return of its inception, which in that case was 20 years ago. So they were required to, to bring in 20 years to prove that they have filed for the last 20 years. Unfortunately, the person that actually testified on the Senate side for this bill is not able to, to be here with us to share their story, but this is the story that was shared on, on the Senate side. And um, as many of you know, those nonprofits, those entities typically have you know, a higher turnover. The officers change over time as often as two to three years, and it's extremely hard to go back and find 20 years of records. Not to mention that those organizations don't have the money and the funds to hire attorney, which can be very expensive. So what this bill does, in the event a report is missed and the entity is forfeited, that entity needs to fill out the form from the time when their charter was forfeited or seven years, whichever is less. So this bill only changes that one specific step. And it's a win-win for everyone. On the administrative end, as that would handle a lot less unnecessary documents, which frankly, they don't have anything to do with the 20 years because most of these nonprofits have zero in some cases, and there's nothing to do. It's just, it's a, simply a paperwork and it's, it's completely useless to them. And this way also those entities can get, go back up, up and running in time to continue their fundraising efforts. And sometimes it, this bill also would potentially put someone in the, in the position to commit fraud because if they can't find 20 years of uh, records, they have to, you know, obviously we're not um, encourage them to make it up, but you know, that you put them in, in a position that, you know, in some cases maybe people do or don't uh, just to, to be able to get revived. So um, I have, um, uh, so this is, um, you know, I asked this committee for a favorable report in this bill and I have a representative from SDAT, Jonathan Glazer to hear, to answer any technical questions and share his, his side if any of the committee members desire to, to hear the, from the SDAT side. And thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Delegate Saab, is Director Higgins going to testify or no? Um, yeah, actually, yes. I'm sorry. I just okay. Okay. was mentioning that um, yeah. Mr. Glazer is just here for uh, technical questions. Okay. Uh, Director Higgins. This is Jonathan uh, here for Director Higgs, um, and I'm just here for technical questions. Thank you so much. Okay. See no about questions. That. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. Oh, my apologies. Delegate Brooks. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, Jonathan, how many years, if I were to go to SDAT and pull up that corporation, how many, doesn't it show uh, the number of uh, years? Is that maybe 10 years you can see immediately whether or not you, you file the re report and what the date is? You are 100% correct. On our online system, you can see the past 10 years of annual reports. Um, this bill aims to say that if you forgot to file an annual report, let's say in 1990, and you've still been filing every year, mm -hmm. we right now require you to prove that you have been filing all those back years, or we make you refile all those back years, because I can only see your past 10 years of annual reports. After that, our system doesn't have the capability to um, look back more than 10 years. I see. So this bill just says a, a statute, oh, go, just take it to the statute of limitation, which is six, seven years is what we're saying. Yeah, yeah. so the, exactly. The reason uh, the sponsors pick said. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Jonathan. <laughs> Mr. Glazer, for some reason, uh, you are not muted, but we can't hear you. Still can't hear you. It, it, he's good, Mr. Chair. I think he. Yeah. He, yeah. Hey, Mr. Glazer, if you could just follow up uh, and send an email to Delegate Brooks to respond to his question. Um, 
uh, we'd appreciate it. And we'll just keep going forward. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. I think to answer the delegate's question is yes, yeah. it's seven years because most, most people keep seven years. I mean, the IRS requests seven years and that's where the number came, came yeah. from that the seven years of record or less. Um, but if you need more information, I'm sure Mr. Glazer can um, yeah. answer it as well. Yeah, yeah. Delegate, he's delegate given delegate. one heck of a t technical answer on you. Um, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, us, over, Mr. Glazer. We appreciate it. All right, anything else, Delgo Brooks? No, that's good. Th thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. All right, thank you. And that concludes the hearing for House Bill 853. Next, we'll go to House Bill 562, Delegate Hornberger. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, for the record, uh, Delegate Kevin Hornberger here on HB 562. Uh, this is a very exciting bipartisan bill that a number of the members may have recognized from previous years. The only difference now is that uh, the president has weighed in and has committed to issue an executive order, parroting some of the language we have in this right to repair bill. And if you take a look at your written testimony, you also see a letter of support from the attorney general's office. So again, a groundswell of support here. And what this bill aims to do is to give the right to repair to farmers explicitly. Uh, what, is, what has been occurring over the last few years is farm equipment has gotten much more technologically advanced is that uh, there have been a coupling of software, electronic devices, uh, et cetera, that dictate the functionality of farm equipment. Um, most, uh, mostly included with tractors. Traditionally, farmers have always been able to repair this equipment or hire a technician, whether it be a factory authorized or an independent repair shop to come out uh, for things that they couldn't fix on site or within their family or um, the skill set that they have. What's been happening over the last few years, uh, and this, this went through in the automotive industry but has been resolved, is that manufacturers are putting devices in that hinder or um, stop individuals from repairing it unless they're an authorized service technician. And that's created two problems. One, there's not enough authorized technicians to come out and fix these devices. So what happens is the farm equipment sits dead weeks, sometimes months waiting on a repair technician to come out. The second problem that it creates is that if a farmer does try to repair it, uh, they could violate their warranty. Uh, they could have uh, civil damages. They could also uh, have a significant reduction uh, when they go to resell that piece of property or resell that to tractor back and upgrade it. So um, what this bill would do would protect that farmer and protect that independent repair shop and would preserve what has been, you know, since the inception of, of modernized farm equipment, the status quo uh, with them having the ability to fix items. Um, I, I want to be really clear here that this is just for farm equipment. You know, we have, may have heard about cell phones and, and all these other things. This does not apply uh, to those to those industries. Um, and then the last thing that I want to uh, point out about this bill is that some of the manufacturers have even gone so far as now to obfuscate part numbers. And what does that mean? Well, let's say I need to do a routine oil change or a um, fuel pump, something that's very very rudimentary in, in nature and repair. I go to New Holland, I go to John Deere distributor, and um, I say, I need this fuel pump part number. And I, and I have the part number off of that. What John Deere and these other companies have done is they have, uh, before I could go and purchase either the John Deere specific or a generic alternative, let's say another manufacturer is creating that. And those part sellers have the ability to cross-reference and say, well, this one isn't officially John Deere, but it's half the price, and uh, but it has the same function. Well, John Deere now is obfuscating those part numbers so that there's no translation across uh, the part numbers, which means if that part isn't on the shelf, you can't replace it because you don't know uh, what it is, even though there might be another alternative there that's cheaper and ready to go. So this bill also protects um, uh, the ability to, to cross-reference part numbers. We have a number of advocates that are signed up on the bill. Uh, you will notice that all the folks that stand to benefit financially uh, from these crazy laws are against this bill. And all the common sense people that own farms uh, or support farmers are for the bill. So with that, I'd love to take any questions. Thank you, Delia Hornberger. And we appreciate you here championing the Democratic agenda.
First up, we have Marshall <laughs> Cahill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee for allowing me to testify. My name is Marshall Cahill. I'm from Chesterville Bridge Farm in Kent County, Maryland, and I support House Bill 562. Uh, House Bill 562 seeks to establish the ability of farmers and third party repair personnel to complete fully functioning repairs of farm equipment. Without this bill, a farmer would need to contact an authorized manufacturer dealer in order to flash a piece of equipment or module with software. And that effectively establishes a monopoly for the manufacturer dealers over the agricultural service industry. Uh, personal story, two years ago, I needed to have an ECM, which is an engine control module replaced on a Challenger tractor, which has a Caterpillar engine in it. The dealer was unable to come out and complete the ECM repair because of scheduling. I was fortunate enough to be able to locate a Caterpillar Marine dealer uh, that was able to flash my ECM and complete the repair in a timely manner and get me back up and running. Because this tractor has a Caterpillar engine, I was able to find this third party provider and complete the service. I feel this option should be available for all farm equipment and I would, it would be especially beneficial to reduce downtime. I also feel that this legislation will be beneficial to the underserved areas in Maryland, including the Lower Shore and Southern Maryland, which have a significantly smaller dealer presence. And finally, I think it's important to note that the goal of this legislation is in no way designed to allow farmers or third parties to tamper with or disable emission systems. And in any suggestion to the contrary is an attempt at using EPA regulations to protect the dealer monopoly over the agricultural service industry. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Harrison. Yes, thank you. For Delegate um, Hornberger, um, <clears throat> I just have a, a, a question or two just for my clarification because I don't pretend to know about tractors or farm equipment, but um, you know, many, many years ago, my dad could repair, you know, pretty much any any vehicle that there was. And um, because, you know, the parts were very easy and, you know, he was just really good with his hands. But as time has gone on and, you know, now everything is computerized, it's not mm -hmm. as easy for someone to get underneath the hood and tinker. And so I, um, my understanding is that um, with farm equipment, that a lot of that is the same now. It's a lot of computer generated, or it's uh, it's you know run by software, the computers. And so um, the one question that I have, um, I guess, center, centers around perhaps some of the safety um, um, issues as it relates to it. So I don't know what might be embedded in the software. Um, I don't know whether it's, you know, an automatic break, automatic braking system or something that if the system detects that there's a problem that it automatically shuts down so that no one gets hurt. Um, if, um, and, and the way that I understand it is that I guess maybe that is sold as a unit for replacement or whatever, which is where the authorized dealers may come in or the authorized repair technician would come in. If by chance um, that is the case, you know, it's something that's um, safety related and someone who's not had that particular training to, um, to deal with that software um, to ensure the, that the safety um, part, the safety, the, to ensure the safety of the um, piece of equipment. Um, <clears throat> if I'm, um, you know, if I got under there and tried to repair it and mess it up, <laughs> huh. um, is there, um, what, what is the, what, what are the repercussions to, to well, is there an, is there a chance that, that the owner of that equipment then could, you know, say that there was a defect in the part, but or the the software piece that they had to replace or whatever, and that individual just may have, you know, missed putting the, you know, oh, hit hitting the one in front instead of the zero or putting, you know, in the old days it would be missing the bolt. But you know, do, do you understand what I'm trying to ask? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm concerned absolutely. about. I'm concerned about the safety, um, maybe the safety pieces of that, um, and certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want anyone to to be injured. Um, but I I don't think it would be fair if if 
um, if something like that happened and, you know, it was a user error and not a manufacturer error? Sure, sure. Great question. And, and there's, a, there's a couple layers there, so I want to address each one of them individually. <clears throat> In terms of the automotive industry, they've already gone through the full evolution of what you've just described. Whereas cars were very rudimentary and simple, and they started having computer controls. Everyone was doing their own thing. You needed to be a special technician. And then the federal government stepped in and said, we need to protect independent repair shops and their ability to continue doing repairs. And they've already moved in the direction many years ago, universal equipment, universal diagnostic tools, uh, and you know, across the industry. And we're looking to, to emulate that now with farm equipment. So uh, that's, that's the first thing that there, there was a, there was a steep increase and, and now the federal government has stepped in. Cars have gotten back to where individuals can work. Out. Your second concern about safety uh, features uh, and you'll also hear some testimony about emissions as well. It's against federal law to tamper with emission devices. And in doing so, if someone were to tamper with an emission device, the, the piece of equipment would not operate. Okay, so these are generally diesel, diesel powered, some cases gas. Uh, they have strict requirements for both uh, emissions, uh, fuel usage, et cetera. Those can't be tampered with. That's a violation of, of, of federal law. Um, secondly, in terms of safety, uh, you had posed the question, if I'm in there and I don't know what I'm doing, can I disable a safety system? The, the, it's a global harmonious device, which is to say that all of, all of the functionality of that equipment is dependent on another. So disabling a piece of a, a safety or, or a brake system or whatever, the, the device will not function. And the same goes for automotive repair as well. Um, it, we're, just, we're just looking to pair it the same fu functionality and ability of, of folks to repair it that's already occurred in the automotive industry. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Delegate Brooks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Delegate Holmberger. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I, I can clearly understand where, where you're coming from on this bill because do, do, downtime is money, you know, and you need that, that, that equipment working and you can't get anybody to come out there and, and repair it. Yeah, I can definitely understand that. But, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out where, um, where the misconnect is here because I always thought that parts and supplies were part of the, the revenue stream for, for these manufacturers, you know? I think if you were to take that equipment and break it down and sell it as parts, you probably could charge five times as much for it, you know? Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't they want to sell parts, you know? And are we talking about aftermarket parts? Or are we talking about OEM parts, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. they're still capturing revenue. And the other part, the other, the other part of this question, are, are we talking about software? Or are we talking about both software and hardware? If you could address those for me, I'd appreciate it. Yep. So, so one at a time, in terms of the, in terms of the, the ability to cross-reference part numbers, okay, there are a number of, of aftermarket companies, just like when I go to AutoZone and I need a new starter from a pickup truck. Mm -hmm. There's the good, better, best. There's the AutoMart version. There's the GM, OEM version. Mm -hmm. Again, all, all of this has already taken place within the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. What, what these companies are doing is they are scrambling the part number reference, which has been an industry standard since the dawn of modern equipment. So as to say, if you need this part to fix your tractor, you only have one choice, and that is the one that has the, the sticker of John Deere on it. And oh, by the way, that's three times as expensive as the alternative, which works fine, meets all the requirements, uh, and they're doing this as uh, because of reasons of profit, right? Mm -hmm. They want to, John Deere wants to sell you a John Deere part. Mm -hmm. However, there's three other manufacturers out there that have the same amount of quality and level of performance that may cost less and, and give you the ability to get your tractor back in service. Mm -hmm. You know, you pointed out a really important point, downtime. Well, when, when these farmers are going out and doing the harvest, yes, time is money but they could lose that entire harvest, that entire crop, if they don't harvest within a certain window of time. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's the super critical thing here is that, unfortunately, for these Atlantic tractors and for these some folks you're going to hear by, everybody needs their air conditioning fixed when it gets really mm-hmm. hot out. Well, everybody needs their farm equipment fixed when it's time to harvest. And they just don't have the manpower or the staff to meet that need. And farmers are losing crops and ability to harvest as a result of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Yep, thank you. Delgie Queen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just have a question for the sponsor, kind of on the line of, um, of what Delegate Harrison was saying. I, 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 re- I recall, too, growing up with uh, family members, uh, especially the men were uh, skilled laborers. And so we did a lot. They did a lot of repairs and stuff. And they would have these manuals. For, you, you talked about cars. I'm thinking about cars more so than the, 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 the uh, tractors. Yep. But they would have these like Chilton manuals and the Haynes manual that would tell them how to do stuff. Are you saying we don't have that for uh, tractor trailers? They don't have that kind of stuff that you could do? So, so the way that it currently stands and, and the anecdotal uh, example that was given by the, the uh, person testifying was that you, you, there are those repair manuals, those do exist, and you get all the way through that repair. You actually change out the part, unbolt the old part, put the new part in. However, when you go to start up the device and go back to farming, there is a computer prompt standing in your way that you can't circumnavigate. And that's the pinch point of how these guys are trying to hold a monopoly, these repair shops that are factory authorized on your ability to operate that piece of device. They say, you know, you can do all the work in the world, but I need to come out there, you know, and make the sign of the cross above the uh, tractor, reflash the prompts, and then you can go farm. And oh, by the way, it's gonna charge, I'm gonna charge you a thousand dollars and I can't come out there for three weeks. That's the pinch point, that's the rub. And that's what's keeping the tractors from being back out there in the fields. So that's kind of getting to, I think, what Delegate uh, Brooks was talking to. That's the difference between the hardware and the software piece. So that mm-hmm. flash piece is now getting into software parts. Um, well, the, the inner workings of the software, which right. how are we handling that at the, um, with so, the automobiles? Because I know the last time I took my car to do something, the, uh, not to the actual shop, and I had to go back because they had to set something to make my radio come back on and sure, some other sure. stuff. I couldn't do it myself. I, we can no longer do the things we used to be able to do mm-hmm. before all the software was embedded. So, so I'm the, trying to get that corollary again. Yeah, yeah, great question. And, um, and I'll put it in as plain speak as possible. The, this bill does not allow you to go in and to change the functionality of the software right? Like the tractor starts up, it gets to a certain operating temperature. I can, there's a rev limiter, all of those sort of things. This bill does not allow you to change the operations of the device. Same thing with your automobile return. What it does allow you to do is to change out the parts. And then um, there's words like reflash or reprompt the system so that it can become operational again within the factory parameters. Thanks. Yep. Great question. Great question, though. Yep. Thank you, Delegate Howard. So even though what you're saying is, is that even though there are things out there you can buy in the automotive world that directly affect the computer chips in your car. I mean, there's tuners that that can, you know, make your car go faster, have more torque, (laughs) or you can actually uh, program your car yourself. You can buy them on eBay uh, or anywhere quite frankly, uh, for more gas efficiency. This this bill doesn't speak to any of that. No, no. And those are used at your own risk. So those folks that buy that factory warranty, boom, out the the door. But they're doing it in the automotive world. And I guess as a follow-up to it, you said something about downtime. Um, What I'm concerned about is, is that, you know, as far as downtime is concerned, sometimes these growing seasons and sort of these harvesting and picking seasons can be very short. Yep. And is climate, does climate negatively affect that? I mean, is, is some of the weather that we get, can that uh, negatively affect um, 
those those harvest seasons in Europe? I mean, yeah. So sure? yeah, farmers farmers have a number of of things that they factor in of when they want to harvest. They can go out and look at the crop and see if it's matured. Mm -hmm. They can go on historical data using the farmer's almanac. Uh, they can look at yield. They can look at when the buy, when the market is is most uh, best to take take that and harvest it. And then also there's supply chains, demands, et cetera. Um, when, when there's a delay that's artificial, which is I can't get my tractor fixed, that severely handicaps their ability to get best price for that crop. Yeah, because it seems like to me, like, and just I'm just spitballing here. Let's say there's a, a, a crop harvesting time of, I don't know, two weeks. Yep. And it rains for four or five days. And you go out on that sixth day and you have your crop harvester break. Mm -hmm. Well, you've only got a week. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And what's happening now, and um, this is just because scale is cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you will have farmers who, who plant the crop, seed the crop, grow the crop, uh, and they may outsource the harvest or they might outsource the entire, you know, the entire operations of the crops. Right. Because if I'm a company and I do eight, eight farms, it's cheaper than if I'm just buying the equipment doing it on my own. So those, those companies that, that do, you'll see the stakes in the ground that have like, you know, Caleb or whatever and a piece of corn. So that's somebody that's working that plot of land, even though they don't own it, okay. um, but they'll have a stake there. Those harvesters are coming in and they are working 24 hours a day during that harvest window to get maximum yield on that crop. That's how and, tight that window is too. Yeah. And if they, if they have a piece of equipment that's down, these are multi-million dollar pieces of equipment in some cases, they're, they're shot. They could go bankrupt. And then we lose all that food, sir. I mean, you've, you've, seen, you've seen grocery stores and empty shelves. Uh, it's only been exacerbated uh, here, here lately. So it's, that's why it's really important to keep these things operational and not have these artificial uh, speed bumps in the way of, of getting them repaired. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Kevin Anderson. Yes. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I'm clear. Yes, sir. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Anderson. I'm a farmer from Somerset County. I believe I am well positioned to discuss this topic with you today because of my life experiences of living and growing up on a farm with a father who was a vice president of a local farm machinery dealership for 30 years. I am currently a farmer. The need for the standalone bill for agriculture came apparent to me last year during the discussion when the bill centered around cell phones, video games, and appliances. The cost of those items were hundreds to thousands of dollars and may have a life expectancy of three to seven years. In agriculture, our machinery can cost over a million dollars for one piece and the life expectancy can be up to 50 years. Our parts and service requirements are very different. 30 years ago, when I left college to, and drove down the Eastern shore, there were tw at least 20 different farm machinery dealerships. Today, there are seven, five which are corporately owned by one entity, two that are not full-fledged dealerships, but are satellite locations. We don't have the time to discuss the labor shortage and qualified and lack of qualified applicants, but the ramifications of this problem are significant to Maryland agriculture and are changing the family farm business model. This is not a brand specific problem. It is an industry wide problem. The Delmarva Peninsula has historically had the greatest capital investment per acre of equipment than anywhere else in the United States. That's a lot of equipment. One of the strongest opponents to this bill may testify to you about how many technicians they have on staff, but probably won't tell you how many are class one ag technicians. The technicians they have on staff service parts of seven states. And they also won't tell you that they are the gold standard of service to the agriculture community in the Mid-Atlantic region. The dealers you won't hear from are the ones with the local sales offices that the service provider is over four hours away, 
charge $125 an hour from the time they leave their shop until they return and additionally charge $2.50 a mile. That's so over a thousand dollars to get them to our farm. Or you might not hear from the dealer that has opted out to have no mobile service team. And if your equipment breaks down, we have to tow or haul our equipment to their location for repairs. We don't Mr. have Anderson? a AAA service to cover our towing. We don't have extended warranty options for older equipment. The business model that prevails in this environment is geared toward large corporate farms that purchase new equipment and keep it under factory warranty. Mr. Anderson. Yes. I'm gonna need you to wrap it up, sir. Okay. My best analogy of how I can explain how this um, works is if your kid has a, a paper that's due and you go to your computer and you try to print your paper, their paper for their 8 a.m. class tomorrow morning and their paper doesn't print. You go to Staples or you go to Walmart or you go wherever you can, you buy a new printer, you bring it home, you plug it into your computer and it doesn't work. But you have the ability to go on the manufacturer's website and download a computer Mr. program uh, that links your computer Mr. Anderson, to the sir. printer. Sir, that I'm gonna, is what we are to... asking for in the agriculture community. Yes, sir. So I, I understand uh, each witness has two minutes. Um, I'm sorry. So we, we have a, a bunch more witnesses that we need to get to, but yep. we do appreciate the email. I... I thank for That's your okay. I thank you for your consideration for favor report. Be happy to share any of my personal experiences or answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Colby Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau uh, here in support of House Bill 562. I think um, this is why I never do prepared uh, oral testimony because I've heard some outstanding questions prior to uh, my testimony and. Uh, uh, really the, the, the crux of where we are, we, we worked sev for several years now trying to address this without having to have legislative intervention. And um, we were at like the last mile, the, the very last uh, five yard line going in. And we've, we've worked with the, with the equipment uh, manufacturers to create diagnostic tools, which and unfortunately we have to pay for at $2,500 a year uh, to maintain that. We've got the ability to, to order the parts online, uh, diagnose what's wrong with the tractor, all the components, order them, bring them in, put them in ourselves. But if it happens to have anything to do with that computer system, we do not have the ability, a third party does not have the ability to fix that problem. So we have to call the dealer, the dealer has to send a technician out and flash the software, plug his laptop in, basically say this part, to pair it to the regular to the rest of the tractor to get it to work, and so that's really where I think uh, Mr. Anderson was coming there at the very end. We don't have that ability to go on to a manufacturer's website, pull that, and download that that app or that that component to allow that computer to talk to the new computer that was just put in. And that's really where the where the rubber meets the road, and where we really need this uh, this component. We've we've worked we've worked tire tirelessly. And unfortunately, that's the piece that's just not getting done. It's the same problem they had in the automobile industry back um, in 2012. And we're here now uh, trying to fix this uh, for the farm equipment industry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the, there's two final witnesses for the favorable, and then we'll get to questions. Jonathan Quinn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Um, I asked for your favorable support in this bill and I just I just want to uh, just want to share a couple of experiences I think the other other folks have given you a good explanation you know a lot of this new equipment I have my own shop I'm a farmer in Kent County I have my own shop on farm which try to do auto repairs myself as much as we can do and a lot of things we can do but we get those parts on and then we have to have a dealer to come flash the system so it'll work. A uh, good example this fall, combine, uh, we had a we had a, 
a, a cylinder that keeps the sieve level. It's got a motor on it, but it's got a computer hooked to it. It was no trouble to change in the field, but we still had to get a service tech to come out and just flash that, flash that drive, and so it would so it would work. Um, so it's it's a uh, it's a lot of things we can do, and we're not asking to to uh, alter any safety things or any emissions or anything like that. We just want to do basic repairs um, in our shop, like we always do. Uh, and this bill would help us do that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. And the final favorable witness, Lindsay Thompson. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lindsay Thompson here today on behalf of the Maryland Grain Producers Association in support of House Bill 562. I think that Delegate Hornberger and the others have explained very well uh, what we're looking to do. Uh, we are essentially looking to be on the same playing field as anyone who wants to go out and get their automobile complete. Um, completely fixed, right? And so you heard that the number of equipment manufacturer authorized dealers has consolidated considerably over the last, um, I would say, especially in about the last 10 years. And so to put it into perspective, you heard that there um, are about 20 um, statewide for one specific manufacturer, and not all of those can even work on farm equipment, right? There are approximately 1,600 auto body repair shops, and those are just the ones that are authorized to do Maryland state safety, safety inspections, and there's many more above that. So we're simply looking for choice. You've heard several times, farming doesn't wait, and I'd like to share a personal example. My family runs a New Holland tractor, a New Holland combine. We used to have a dealer 15 minutes away, worked out great. Now our closest dealer, um, is in Delaware or Pennsylvania. And during harvest several years ago, we had an issue. We were waiting for service technician and they told us it was gonna be two weeks. You can't wait two weeks during harvest. And luckily the ag community is wonderful and we had friends come in and help us harvest that crop, uh, but it shouldn't have to be that way. We should be able to have choice in who is fixing our farm equipment uh, and not only be tied to the equipment manufacturers. And I request a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Queen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So I think I wanna get to the comments that were just made by um, Ms. Thomas and, and earlier by Mr. Ferguson. Cause I know we've, we've been working on trying to find a resolution for this, but the, the part that I'm not understanding that hasn't happened yet is just that, providing more choice. Why haven't we put together some kind of program to train young um, men, young women to understand how to fix this? This is, we have so many unemployed youth and yet this is something we could, could do to put a training program together so folks would know how to fix these vehicles, these, um, these tractors. We know we have, we know what the farming season is, so we know we're gonna need extra or doing this time frame to handle the surge. I mean, this seems like a great job that we could be putting together from some workforce development area to make sure we have folks who understand this. I'm just not <laughs> sure why that hasn't been a solution. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is definitely an opportunity to do that, Delegate Queen. So right now with the only full service uh, repair available through the equipment manufacturers, there is a finite number of jobs that are available in that field with those equipment manufacturers. If we were to open this up for the ability for third party independent repairs, uh, repair shops to be able to do this, as well as the farmers themselves. You heard uh, Jonathan Quinn say he has a shop. So if he was able to do the full service repair himself, then he might hire another person to be you know, his equipment um, mechanic during the harvest season. And so if we were able to expand the authority of who is able to fix the equipment, then yes, I definitely think that that would open the door to some of those workforce development things that you just mentioned. 
Um, so, so that could be something where it would be tailored to that specialized training would be needed before you could do this. So the bill would have to be crafted to say, we're trying to develop workforce development, not just have every, you know, every individual tinker with material, tinker with those uh, products. So that's my concern. Thank you, though. Thank you, Delegate no, Adam. If I may, Mr. Chair. The, no, um, no, it, no, 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 Delegate Adams. Thank you, Vice Chair. And uh, Delegate Hornberger, you'll get your shot here because I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> In the years past, uh, you were right. This was a, a omnibus bill that related to any uh, uh, electronic device for the purpose of repair. And in, in years past, I've had real concerns uh, that I've articulated in, in public and also one-on-one -on -one as it relates to intellectual property. And I thought I would just ask you, uh, as courtesy to the, uh, to the sponsor of the bill, what are your thoughts on intellectual property? Who, since we're talking about farm equipment, who, uh, who has or owns the, uh, the intellectual property? And do you see any problems with your bill uh, with relationship to that. I don't have a preconceived notion on this. I'm asking this freshly because last night I was having a conversation with someone about this. And I, I'll just simply say that I thought that it, when we were talking about video games and, uh, you know, cell phones, uh, you know, those seem to be different conversations, but at the end of the day, they're, they're not right. I mean, we're still dealing with electronics and, and, and just, I wanted your thoughts on intellectual property. That's been the hang up for me in the past on bills like this. Yeah, so you know we have to we have to look at these computer uh, drivers. We call them the brain. We call it the ECM. Uh, however, you want to call it, that is a black box, right? No one here is going to go in and steal coding or or steal prompts or steal the software, the IP that's associated with that. It's just a matter of uh, having a device that makes it so that after that repair is done, it can go back to full functionality, right? That's it. The, the, these farmers are not in the business of stealing intellectual property uh, or, or somehow selling that to other providers or competition. Oh, well, the delegate, I'm not suggesting that farmers are stealing anything. I'm, I'm asking whether or not these manufacturers uh, have a right to the intellectual property. It's sort of a yes or no uh, to the point. I mean, I know, yeah, absolutely. Law, I'm asking a legal question, which means yep. if there's ever a yes or no to this, but it's just at first blush the concerns I have for bills. Yeah, they, they absolutely have a right to maintain their IP. However, my argument is they don't have a right to keep someone from operating the device. All right. Because of a paywall. Well, I'd like to, I'll follow up with you further. It's, it's an important bill. It certainly is controversial, but I, I, I do have some honest questions that we can do offline. Uh, Vice Chair, I do have a question for the Farm Bureau. Uh, of course, I, I am a mid-shore, rural, uh, eastern shore representative, and I'm, I'm listening. So was, I, I don't see Colby on my screen, but I do have a question. It's a pretty simple one. He's here. Go ahead, Doug. Get out. Okay, so, so, you know, so the, the question is, okay, we passed the law or passed the bill, it becomes law, and farmers have the ability to make these repairs I don't know what the cost of a combine is. So let, let me just throw a rough number out, $500,000. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, so they go to sell that piece of equipment after 10 years, they take their depreciation, whatever that looks like, and they sell that to the next uh, person along the way and the piece of equipment uh, fails in some material regard. Uh, how does the Farm Bureau uh, settle that particular conversation? I mean, as right now, I think that there is structure and a rigid nature as to how a half million dollar piece of equipment gets repaired. So if we loosen that up, uh, how does the Farm Bureau reconcile uh, those sort of issues? And where, do, where does the farmer, after having made a used purchase, uh, re, uh, you know, get satisfaction when a piece of equipment doesn't actually work? This uh, probing question, I don't have the right answer, or wrong answer. I'm honestly trying to settle this out since I'm representing rural Eastern Shore of Maryland? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. Um, and it's a question we've had discussions with uh, equipment manufacturers for the last two years. And that's, that's been a big argument on their part is, you know, well, if all of a sudden everybody just starts fixing their own equipment and it doesn't get fixed right and they come in and they trade it in for a new piece of equipment, then we get stuck with a lemon. And we're, you know, 
the, the, the thing that I have, I, the vast majority of the individuals that are going to work on these are going to be either the, the equipment dealers or third-party repair entity because the, the cost of the repair equipment, just to put like the combine that's in the back of my screen, uh, to put that, to work on that piece of equipment, you're not going to go buy a couple of wrenches in a, in a, um, in a floor jack and expect to fix um, all the parts in that. I mean, there's, there's some tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And they, a, a, we've got several people that have retired from, from being um, technicians from a, from a dealer. And they can't get into this game because they're not considered a, an authorized dealer. And because are an authorized technician, and if they're not an authorized technician, they can do 95% of the of the work, but they can't do that last 5%, which is the flashing of the software. And so it doesn't do a farmer any good to to work with one of those third parties. Honestly, that's where the biggest problem of it is: is that third parties are not allowed to be to play in this game um, all the way to the from from start to finish. So I I hear what you're saying. Um, it does come back to when you're, you know, after five years or whatever, the, and the warranty wa runs out, a uh, 10-year piece of equipment's going to have issues with it, whether it was done by an independent uh, repair dealer or it was done by uh, an authorized dealer, um, you know, that's just going to be part of the deal. I don't, you know, when it comes right down to it, there's no warranties left on them at 10 years old. And when you buy a piece of farm equipment, um, you, you know, I, I've bought used equipment myself. Nicole, we just because it's uh, no longer under warranty doesn't mean it's not a marketable asset, and that's the that's mm -hmm. the problem. I mean, the the uh, without naming names, I know you've got the yellow and blue, you've got the green and yellow, and the different manufacturers, and those the, those colors and brands have impeccable uh, meaning to uh, farmers because of reliability, and it, it it's an important bill. I'll I'll just stop here and uh, vice chair and say it's an important bill, but there's a lot going on here. So thank you. Thank you, Delegate Mounts. Um, thanks, Chairman. And um, uh, Colby, I've got a couple of questions I wanted to kind of run by you. And um, thank, thanks for testifying. Um, uh, so there are, um, there are, um, are there a list? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I think Delegate Adams did a great job of trying to hone some of the issues. And um, and, and, and I understand that, you know, many, many parts are already available. Many repairs are already available. Is there, and are you aware of any repairs that are prohibited by federal law because of federal requirements, number one? And then number two, is there a way um, to identify problem areas where for some reason there isn't access to the parts and things, certain, certain types, I mean, you know, uh, more prevalent type repairs that we, you're getting complaints about or we're hearing about that we're not, they're not able to service that need to be, you know, specifically addressed. And so it's two parts. Are you aware of any federal laws that prohibit, you know, um, um, uh, individuals from doing their own repairs as far as um, settings and things like that? And, um, and, then, and then number two, are there, are there areas specific areas in, in repairing farm equipment that are routinely problematic that um, in, that farmers are saying they're not able to do the work because um, because of this uh, this threshold so I'll start with the first uh, question there um, federal law obviously um, limit uh, prevent you from doing any tampering to emissions um, or any of the safety, can't do any override. So if a part, so I guess where you would you would see that is where, where most of the issues come in. Let's say it's a an engine repair, um, a, a computer module re compare uh, repair within, and and you've got a piece of farm equipment that's tying to a to a tractor. And when you when you take out that um, piece of hardware that needs to be replaced, it comes in blank. It's just like a like when you would replace your hard drive in your computer, it comes in completely blank. You plug it into your computer. It's not gonna do anything until you pair it to the computer and actually start to put in, inputs onto that hard drive. And where the problem lies is um, in farm equipment, 
the equipment manufacturers have not given that component, that ability to take that blank piece of hardware and get it to wrap in with the, with the rest of the computer system. And so as long as that piece is not replacing any kind of emissions or changes like that, which in this case, you wouldn't be doing that. You wouldn't be replacing an emissions failure. Um, that would that would fall into some other, whether it be a transmission or something like that, that would be taken out. So I don't see on the federal side of it that, uh, you know, that those are those are federal laws that you can't, whether you're an authorized or unauthorized, you're not going to be able to. And that's not what the farmers are looking to fix. Um, second piece you were asking was what was that again? Um, the prevalent areas of repair. Is it, you know, is it? The, yeah. You know so. What I mean? Yeah, so the so obviously most repairs are broken broken parts, broken p physical pieces of equipment on the on the you know whether it be um, um, in the in the combine with an auger system or something like that or or something that that a thrasher that goes bad or a head you run a run a deer up into the head of the combine and you have to do repairs for that. Those kinds of components are fixable. Those ones farmers can do now if they have the the means and the ability to do them. Where we where we're where we're all we're talking about right now is when it comes to that computer, um, anything that has to deal with the computer. So if all of a sudden sensor comes on, I plug my diagnostic tool in and it says that it is something to do with the back with the rear computer, and you you order that piece of hardware that comes in and you plug it into that you take out the old piece and plug in the new piece. That right now is the part that we cannot we can't do anything with unless you're an authorized dealer. We, we know my major repair, uh, be careful what you wish for, because my major repair is a diesel fuel line. <laughs> and that's no joy to be able to repair. But no, thank you for answering my questions. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you, Delegate in Polaria. Um, yes, Kobe, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. This, so here's a problem that I dealt with. John Deere, um, Gator spoke about this last year. I think this is a fantastic bill. We need this bill. Um, that John Deere um, Gator had a bad fuel pump. And so it's $20 repair, electric fuel pump, boom, stick it on, restarts, we're going. That Gator knew that that was not that factory electric fuel pump. It knew it. There was nothing you do to get around it. So then we go and we try to order one. Up, oh, obsolete. Gator isn't that old but that part isn't made anymore. So then the next step was took it into the dealer. After a three month search nationwide, one was finally found and it cost more to put that fuel pump on than it did the value of the Gator. So here's my question for you. What is the actual lifespan, the true lifespan of those pieces of equipment behind you? I would think 40 to 50 years, I know people are still running them. So, well, I mean, obviously it, it depends on the, you know, how hard the piece of equipment is worked. You know, if it's a combine that you, you, you have 400 acres and you, you harvest 400 acres a year or twice a year, depending on what crops you grow, then obviously that combine's not going to be run as hard as some a piece of equipment that farms 10, 15, 20,000 acres a year. And so uh, obviously the, the, I, I have a, I have a Kubota tractor here on my farm and I bought it in 2005 and it was used when I bought it and I still run it to this day. And, and honestly, I, when I have service that needs to be done to it, I take it to the, to the uh, equipment dealer. I, I'm not the person that is looking to get this bill passed because I don't have the time nor the expertise to fix my own equipment. However, there are farmers out there that do. I think that uh, Jonathan Quinn, who testified earlier, is, is a prime example of somebody I know I've got a farmer, it's a neighbor of mine that actually the Klaus choppers, which chop the this corn silage, they send the prototypes to his place for him to tinker with, tear down, put back together and tell him what's wrong with them. That's a farmer that can fix his own piece of equipment, doesn't need a dealer to, um, to have to come out and flash his software. So I agree with you. Um, the, these farmers need the ability if they have the capabilities and, and have the ability to use a third party, they should have them. And, and I guess the answer I was really getting to was the fact that I got a 40-year-old piece of equipment. Now, the 40-year-old piece of equipment, I can get all the parts for. I can fix that myself. There's no problem with that. But as these million-dollar pieces of equipment get older and the parts become obsolete, and obviously, 
John Deere, Kubota, you name them, they want them to become obsolete. They want that beautiful piece of equipment that's sitting in your barn that you now have to get rid of it, even though it works perfectly, except for that one or two parts that are going. And that's, see, I know everybody's looking at what is the problem right this moment? The problem is what's down the road? We shouldn't be throwing away, if we're supposed to be a society that's supposed to recycle, we shouldn't be throwing away a million dollar piece of equipment because it's 20, 30 years old because somebody stopped making the parts for it. There should be ability for these people, not only to fix it right now, but also to be fixing it into the future because you know, I would hate to spend that kind of money. And then who's going to buy it from me? It used to be I had a piece of equipment, I could sell it. But if none of the parts are available and now the third party isn't even allowed to readapt the part to it when it's a 30-year-old piece of equipment, that's a real problem. It's actually theft because you're stealing that piece of equipment that belonged to that person. So that, that's, I think, what I was trying to get to. And um, I like the bill. I don't think the bill needs any work. I think the bill is, you know, 20 years past two, to be honest with you. Well, if you want any more information, Delegate, um, I know Kevin Anderson, who testified earlier, um, he's another one of those that, that wears his equipment out because it's so expensive. He would definitely be one to reach uh, to talk with you about that. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like there's going to be more discussion in Republican caucus. We're going to go to the unfavorables. First up, we have Alan Schaefer. Okay, Mr. Schaefer. I do not see him in here. We'll go to Nicholas George. Hello, Chairman, Committee members. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Nick George. I'm with the Mid Midwest Southeast Equipment Dealers Association. Uh, we represent equipment dealers in 12 states, including Maryland. Uh, we're opposed to this bill. We don't think it's necessary. As you heard in this discussion so far, 95% uh, of the parts or, or more uh, can already be purchased and people can work on their own equipment. It sounds like the last little bit, that software part is what uh, advocates of this bill are looking for. Uh, many, my understanding is that many of our members don't have access to that either. So we don't think it's, it's necessary. We are concerned that the fair and reasonable terms uh, requiring the OEMs to, to uh, sell to uh, third parties uh, will act like a disincentive uh, for many of our members who are dealers um, who currently store millions of dollars in inventory uh, so that it is readily available. Uh, they they uh, train their um, employees to work on the equipment. We think this bill will be a disincentive. Another concern of ours is safety. I, I understand that uh, often uh, uh, people can't tell if a machine has been worked on or it's been altered or modified. Uh, that creates a safety concern, which in turn may create some liability concerns. Uh, none of those are addressed in this, in this uh, bill here. And then finally, we talked about earlier, they were talking about um, secondary markets. Um, what if a dealer doesn't know if a machine has been worked on and uh, sells it and the new customer has a faulty piece of equipment. That's a concern. These are all questions that, that come up uh, and are part of the reasons that we do oppose this. Thank you for giving me the time to talk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Tim Lambert. Good afternoon, Chairman Wilson, members of the committee. My name is Tim Lambert, and I've held various service roles for the Carter Machinery Organization throughout my 28-year career. Carter Machinery is the Caterpillar dealer serving the state of Maryland. We operate over 14 locations within the state with over 400 employees. We are strongly opposed to the passage of HB 562. Caterpillar customers are already given access to many software codes to help them repair their equipment. They can access log diagnostic codes, perform diagnostic testing calibrations, and monitor, monitor their equipment in real time. We draw the line, however, at providing access to embedded codes that control the safety and federal EPA emissions compliance on machines. Given access, they could manipulate the coding to disengage built-in safety features of the machines 
such as safety levers on excavators, seat sensors, overload sensors, etc. We're concerned that access to such codes will invite the tampering of complex engine and hydraulic systems on machines operating near the public. Our power generators also serve as critical backup to hospitals, data centers, and local and state government buildings. And providing access to unqualified personnel could pose a risk to the occupants of those buildings resulting in injury or even death. At Carter Machinery, we invest hundreds of thousands of dollars each year in training technicians. As you know, there is a nationwide shortage of qualified technicians, and we are committed to training, mentoring, and ensuring that our techs are the best qualified to be servicing Caterpillar equipment. Carter invests in several community colleges throughout the state, such as Baltimore County P-Tech, Sollers Point, Carroll County Career and Tech Center, amongst others, in order to maintain a pipeline of qualified students. Carter also has an accredited 15-month training program with the state of Maryland for apprenticeships for students to help fill the void of technicians. In closing, out of an abundance of caution for the public safety and environmental concerns, we are uh, unfavorable for HB 562. Thank you, sir. Greg Blaska. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Blaska, the CFO of Jessica Wink. We are a family owned business celebrating over 50 years, in, 50 years in business. We are a John Deere construction equipment dealer that sells from time to time to the farming market. We have five locations in Maryland and other locations in Mass in New York. Uh, I've, I've been uh, testifying over five years on these type of bills and not one time have they passed. As a company, we always, always supported our customers repair as come. In the beginning, because I go back working 40 years, Manuals and paper copy, from paper to CDs to where we have onboard diagnostic systems to a higher level of diagnostic platforms. This offering is to all customers and to independent chair shops. Uh, this means that our customers have timely and local access to the replacement parts they need to increase uptime. Our equipment requires highly trained technicians. Last year, we spent over three quarters of a million dollars in training. Again, our business is to give the customer the right to support and offers an array of tools to do that. But this bill goes way far beyond that. It allows unfitted access to admissions and, and safety systems. And this is what, why we're against this bill. Modifications either accidentally or intentionally. It's the intentionally that I'm concerned about. We are just so concerned about the safety of its employees, our customers, employees, and the general public that this equipment could be around. We have semi autonomous and fully autonomous equipment now on the market. And in the future, things will get even more technical. And what, what we're seeing is that we're talking about the ability, what people want is that ability to, to make those changes. And, that's, and, that should not, and that should not happen. Again, this le legislation opens up a number of liability issues that will have a financial impact for our <coughs> industry, specifically for many equipment owners, who purchase their equipment in the secondary market, which, which is out there, or unable to determine when their equipment was modified operating. In conclusion, the unintended co uh, consequences of HP 560 are wide ranging, it would be detrimental rather than advantageous to the safety of the environment, to the equipment users, and would impact the development and innovation. The safety of equipment users and bystanders must always sure, be. I'm going to need you to start to wrap this up. And I just did. This is unfair. Okay. Thank you. Maurice Gladhill. Maurice Gladhill. I can see um, you. Thank you for letting me speak to the committee this evening. My third generation John Deere dealer. My family has held a John Deere dealer contract since 1937. There are many misconceptions about what Delegate Hornsberger has presented here this evening. There are um, over $1.5 million worth of parts in my parts inventory. We sell parts regularly to independent repair shops and other small, uh, small customers, small businesses. The automotive legislation does not require automotive manufacturers to sell parts directly to uh, third-party repair shops or customers at cost. The parts margin in my business 
is what pays my fixed expenses. Nearly one third of my business volume is uh, in part sales. More than 60% of that goes to individuals that are doing their own repair. There's a lot about this legislation that, that is not appropriate and not well thought through. If this is enacted as it exists today, it will leave our customers with fewer choices and less parts availability. Um, I'm, I'm proud to play a significant role in the ag community as an ag service provider, um, but this is a piece of legislation that will be more harmful than good. The individual instances of where a customer has not been able to repair something himself is more the rare exception than the norm in this industry. For an individual farmer to have the ability to flash the engine control unit on a $500,000 combine is not practical in today's world. A large corporate farm that had 25 combines can easily invest in the same services that I invest in with respect to training and computers uh, and software, but for an individual farmer to be able to do that is not practical. The bill is ambiguous and provides access to software uh, that is not necessary Many, many things that our customers want are already available. Uh, part numbers are online. Uh, there's, there's nothing hidden or embedded in those. So Go to the website to wrap up. and look up a part number. Thank you. Unfavorable, Thank you. please. Delegate in Polaria. Thank you. Um, Greg, your picture wasn't up there, but you know, I just have to ask you, because obviously I must have lived in a different world because before these computer chips existed, this safety standard must have not been in effect because we didn't have a problem. When people could fix their own equipment, we didn't have fields out there of dead bodies. Can you tell me where the fields of dead bodies are in these industries when these computer chips didn't exist? I would think you know the equipment maybe was more dangerous according to what you're saying back then but that just wasn't the case. People were professionals on farms and knew how to operate them. So how is it so much more dangerous now than it was then before all these safety devices were put on? Are we just getting stupider as the public? That's my question to you, Greg. You still there? Uh, yeah, I can answer it. And the answer is yes. Okay, this we are stupid. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The answer is yes. I just want to hear your arrogance. Okay, yeah. that, you don't need that, to that refer to people point. as stupid. And Mr. Blaska, if you're going to answer, my apologies. I guess my chat was blocking your your uh, little. Oh, that's okay. I, I'm I okay. need you to I need you to turn your camera on. That's right. I, 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 I don't need. To you say know what? It's, it is on. It... Well, I'm just seeing a black screen, sir. And, and then, how long do you yeah. think that these farmers should be held hostage? Should they be held hostage on a five-year piece of equipment, 10-year piece of equipment, a 20-year piece of equipment. When, when will a third market be able to start making these products such as are made in the um, auto industry that I can buy a computer for a car that doesn't come from the manufacturer? At, at what point do we allow these farmers access to this stuff? Please repeat your question. Uh -oh. I, I, you at, at what at what point, how long do you hold them hostage? At five years, do you release the information? At 10 years, at 15 years, how long do you plan to you know, hold this intellectual property over them? And then once you decide not to make the product anymore, the equipment will never work again because they can't get the stuff. How long before that a third party should be able to make this equipment so these pieces of equipment can keep operating or how long should you hold the only license to operate and repair this equipment? Well, why don't you answer? I think you should, I think you need to answer it because technology moves. I asked the questions on. here. I asked oh. the questions here. Okay. All well, right. as well, far as I understand, as far as I understand, Deer supports the product. As far as you understand, Deer supports the product. Not, yeah. not in the case. I'm oh, a John Deere you're, dealer. You're, you're I, right. I only can speak you're, of you're John. Not, in I the can, case that I brought up, yeah, they supported the product at double what the piece of machinery was worth. They did because they had made the piece of equipment obsolete and a nationwide search had to be 
done to find it. I would have never repaired it, but the I, business owner decided he wanted to. You know what? So, I, I can't. The only thing I can answer is that we were an ag dealer many, many years ago, and I remember repair, uh, getting getting the parts on 1940, 1950 machines, two cylinders, two two cycle diesels. So. I can't respond to what you're talking to that specific issue that you're talking to, but I've seen because it. Because you know as well as I do, this new equipment is more technical when it isn't prosper just for the corporation to make it anymore. They stop making. I guess here's the question. How long are they required by law to make the repair parts for it? What is the time by law that they're required to make a repair part for that machinery? Mr. Belaska, I think you're on mute. Yeah, he is. And, and if you still hear me, I know car dealers are only required to make them for five years. And after five years, they don't have to continue making a part anymore. So what do you do when it's the six year comes? Well, our, our, I mean, our equipment is used for decades. So I don't know. I don't understand your question then. Well, then obviously, okay. I, I obviously think you don't want to. I think you 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 need more information. information. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Your lack of answer is the lack of answer that the farm people have been getting from you for years. The lack of your answers to me is what the farmer is getting from you. That's the truth of the matter. So thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate Impolaria. Delegate Howard. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Why not just bring in third party techs? Why not just bring in a third party tech? Especially to underserved areas. Why, why aren't we doing that? Is that question directed to uh, somebody? The, to the, I couldn't see as the, the, the gentleman that Delegate Impolaria, I guess, was just talking yeah. to. Uh, Mr. Blaska, uh, again, we're only seeing a black screen here, but go ahead, sir. Okay, so what's the question? Why not bring in a third, why not bring in third party techs? I don't well, see a problem. Why? I don't understand that. We have third party techs. But we have people coming in repairing, repairing. We have customers repairing their own equipment completely. So I don't, I don't understand. Again, we're a you know, we're a uh, you're talking about your ag specific equipment. Mm -hmm. I sell to the ag business. We sell construction equipment. You sell construction equipment. Right. That's why, that's why I was saying that, that's when my introduction was. We sell it to the customer. We're brought into this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I, so, I mean, I don't, you know, what you're bringing up, I don't, I have not seen. Okay, well, that's fine. I mean, is, anybody, I mean to, is there anybody yeah. else? I mean, I just spitball in here, but I apologize not, for you. I apologize. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, you know, why not bring in, why not bring in third party techs? Anybody? Third, I mean, I, I know you just tried to answer it, but okay. Yeah, I can. This is more than I know there. Frederick, Maryland. Um, let me say that third-party techs are, are readily available and are eating my customers all the time. Now, for a third-party tech to have the latest available technology on machines that have had less than a year or two years of field experience is very difficult. You're talking about training, equipment, hardware uh, that we as dealers have only been exposed to. Uh, but Toyota dealer, does it all the time. Nissan does it all the time and, the and aircraft do it, industry do it, does it, do it all the well. time we the, do the, it as the, well it may not be available to them day one but it will be available delegate hornberger no, did you no, have something no you one to... no one is being held hostage yeah what what i would add is that uh you know dictatorships are great if you're the dictator and monopolies are great if you're the one holding the monopoly um what, uh, what we're seeking to do here is when you own something, you own it. So if you buy that million dollar piece of farm equipment, <laughs> I mean, you should darn well be able to fix it yourself all the way to get it back in the field and operational. Now, these guys are not priests that can only read the Bible because it's written in Latin, okay? But they think that they are. And because they have this monopoly, they're able to charge exorbitant fees. And they wanna maintain that. And I. I respect that they want to make as much profit as possible, but our farmers are losing out and they need to have the ability to own the piece of equipment that they paid so much money for. I mean, in many cases, these farmers are leveraging their farm that they've had for two, 300 years in the family to take out loans to buy this equipment. Oh yeah, I agree. I mean, I've got, I've got farms in my district that people literally can break out deeds from the King. Yep. I mean, 
It's unbelievable. They're having okay. to put that on the line uh, so that these guys can get, you know, one more pound of flesh. So that's, that's why we want to put the power back to the farmers and let them fix it all the way through. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I know you are having some technical difficulty, Mr. Schaefer. So we're going to come back to you, Alan Schaefer. Thank you very much, Chairman uh, Frosch and members of the committee. I'm the executive director of the Diesel Technology Forum. I'm coming to you from my home office here in Frederick, Maryland. I'm here today in opposition to uh, HBO 562. You've got my written statement there. Let me just summarize a few things. Um, as you've said correctly, diesel is the main technology that powers most farm equipment today. The newest generation of diesel achieves near zero emissions, thanks to some very advanced emissions control technology systems. Um, this bill proposes to provide individuals with the ability to access uh, the software code and programming that uh, controls these very advanced systems. We believe that it's considered to be tampering and in, uh, not in compliance with US EPA. Um, I think that if this bill is enacted, it's going to make Maryland's air dirtier, not cleaner, uh, increase the nitrogen oxide deposition in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, not making the bay more healthy. Um, there's a, plenty of potential for these repairs to jeopardize the safety of not only the motoring public, uh, but also the operator that chooses to make these kind of changes. So there's a whole variety of reasons. Another one I wanna bring up is that this bill, if enacted, would also undermine the Maryland Department of the Environment's recent amendments to COMAR 26.11.20 mobile sources, enforcement, and tampering regulations they've just passed. Uh, they don't have the resources to do that on motor vehicles. Um, how will they enforce anti-tampering on tractors here? Well, if you have not requested it, I suggest that you contact the Maryland Department of the Environment for their perspective on whether or not this regulation, the proposed law, would be uh, supportive of that or not. Let me conclude with this. Some of you might remember as a few years ago, Volkswagen was uh, found to be in violation of the Clean Air Act thanks to an emissions cheating scandal. It involved manipulating the device software, reprogramming the vehicles to achieve emissions levels um, at certain times, but not others. They paid $30 billion for that violation. This legislation is going the same exact direction. It's bad for Maryland, it's bad for clean air, and we strongly oppose it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mel Goldsmith. Good afternoon, Chairman Wilson, members of the House Economic Matters Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present uh, to you today on this important bill. Uh, my name is Mo Goldsmith and I'm the CEO for Atlantic Tractor. Our dealership has 15 locations, 13 of those in the beautiful state of Maryland. I have submitted written testimony in addition to the oral testimony I'm about to give. I wanna make you uh, aware of a couple of things here that were stated here that I think we've got to get some clarity on because I really think at the end of the day, what this bill is about is about access to information that we do not currently provide, which is a very small, I believe from the data that we have, it's less than 2% of the repairs and which requires access to the electronic engine controls for purposes of reprogramming. So again, let me clarify that. We think, and I've heard one of the statistics, 95%, we think it's 98% that the uh, technician, the farmer, whoever, has the ability to do the entire repair on their own. The desire for this access is interesting in that Atlantic Tractor, an authorized John Deere dealer, we can only undertake reprogramming with OEM oversight. While technology continues to advance, there is no way currently to allow a customer to reprogram a controller without giving full access to the embedded code in the process. The secured process used today is designed to ensure that the engine outputs and safety mechanisms are kept as specified by the OEM. This in turn protects the long engine life and ensures that the engine emissions comply with EPA requirements. It is important to note that the size and complexity of much of this machinery we're talking about in many respects, these machines are no longer driven by mechanics as much as they are being driven by wiring electronics. It is very conceivable that someone could become seriously injured as a result of modifying code or improper training. Without such safeguards, the safety and emission advances to protect equipment users, bystanders in our environment are unnecessarily put at risk with safety as our top priority, the unfettered access without H, uh, assault within HB 562 is irresponsible. Therefore, we ask for an unfavorable committee report. Thank you. And the final witness for today, Dennis Rasmussen. Who I do not see in the waiting room. Okay. 
Well, that concludes a fascinating, a fascinating hearing for House Bill 562. Uh, I want to thank all the members on behalf of Chair Frosch, <laughs> uh, and I will see everybody tomorrow. Take care.